Oh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. So before we start, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping points. Our event will be 45 minute session on digital accessibility trends 2023. Please put all your questions in the chat or in the Q&A section of the webinar. We will try to address all questions by the end of the session. In case the time doesn't permit, our team will get back to you. Uh, cool. Well, it's time to start the webinar and also introduce our speaker. Hope uh, you all have an informative time with us. Over to you guys. Thank you so much, Mansa. Yep. All right. Um, great. So greetings of the day, everyone. I just wanted to avoid good afternoon, good evening, good morning, because I know people are there from different time zones. So I think greetings works best. Um, so thank you, everyone, for making the time to join this um, webinar uh, where we would be talking about the digital accessibility trends in 2023. Uh, I hope everyone can see my screen. All right. If I can just get a yes or something on the chat. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yes, Evan. Yeah. Super. Okay. Great. So, um, you know, I'll I'll typically um go ahead and start off with uh, the introductions and the two speakers we are today. So one is me, which is Abin. Um, so my name is Abin Roy Chaudhary, and um, I'm the VP for Business Development for DQ, APAC, Australia, New Zealand, and Middle East. Um, I have a overall um, 17 plus years of experience uh, in working in various leadership roles with various MNCs and Fortune 500 companies um, and funded startups. Um, I have been with DQ now uh, for over close to 46 months and uh, I'm an active um, digital accessibility promoter and I help organizations to start their digital accessibility journey uh, with obviously the help of DQ's uh, tools, products, and services. So that's quickly about me. Uttam, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, Ben. Thank you very much, Evan. Hi. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, informative session. So to introduce myself, I'm Uttam Kumar. I work as a solution architect at DQ India. Prior to DQ, I have around six plus years of experience of working in multiple strategy consulting firms. At DQ, uh, my main role actually hovers around to analyze clients' requirement, uh, assess their maturity state uh, in accessibility, and suggest them the best possible products and solution that suits their requirement. So uh, that's a brief introduction from my side. Awesome. Over to you. Thank Over you. to you, Yeah. Thank you. Um, we also have our emails up here. Um, my email is abin.choudhury at dq.com. And Uttam's email is uttam.kumar at deque.com. In case you want to reach out to us at any point of time, I just thought this would help. Um, Awesome. So I, I would now quickly move to the agenda of our discussion today. So what we want to cover today is um, what is digital accessibility and um, the digital accessibility trends at a glance um, in terms of how things have been progressing, how you know various organizations have been taking things up. And also, um, I would like to talk about eventually the journey towards digital accessibility and self-sustainability, right? So uh, with that, um, I would like to kind of talk about what is digital accessibility, right? So for me, um, when someone asks me, right, you know, what is digital accessibility? Um, I, I typically do not want to refer uh, to terms like you know people with disabilities as the way I see accessibility is enabling all users to be able to use any digital application on any device. It can be a mobile, it can be tablet, desktop, any documents. I say that because you know if you uh, if you look at it from the perspective, any user who is commuting might want to watch videos and with the background noise. 
um, we may prefer to use captions, which is accessibility requirement uh, for people with hearing disabilities. Now, this is just one example where I'm saying, you know, how it benefits all, right? So if, if I have to look at the term of what is digital accessibility, I would say when everyone, regardless of disability, can get same information and use the same functionality within an application or uh, on any device, that's where I say that it would ideally be the perfect digital accessibility solution. Um, with, with that, I, I also want to kind of quickly move towards setting up a, a discussion where you know, we would talk about what are the digital accessibility trends and why, you know, this has, why this has become more and more prominent that we need to ensure digital accessibility is taken care of, um, you know, and and how has that been impacting our day-to-day -day life? Um, Uttam, do you want to take it up from here? Thank you very much, Avin, for setting up the initial context. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, from uh, here onwards, we will be continuing our discussion on trends in digital accessibility. But before going uh, through that, uh, it is imperative for us to understand that when we talk about digital accessibility, we mostly refer to making the products coming from the tech industry, industries uh, uh, accessible to everyone. So, uh, in order to understand that, we also need to understand that the trend in digital accessibility has a direct relationship with the trend in tech industry. So first, let's have a look at uh, these two, three years, what was the trend in the tech industry? Abin, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. So the most significant thing actually that we have experienced uh, uh, in last two, three years was the pandemic. And pandemic actually posed multiple challenges which affected each one of us, starting from the challenges uh, faced by the working professional to work from home. Uh, the challenges were also faced by the students to learn from home. Uh, the many recruiters who were struggling to get a best fit for any requirement uh, over call or over the limited feature online portals. Uh, it also posed challenges to meet our daily needs, uh, be it uh, uh, getting groceries, be it uh, getting food delivered to our doorstep or the vegetables, whatever things you think about your daily needs, those are covered here. Then obviously the medical needs, which were the most significant thing during the pandemic, mostly the elderly and the children were much affected by this challenge. And obviously the financial need uh, uh, where the, the people generally, when they want to uh, get some banking uh, services or insurance services, they face certain challenges. And also the financial need, needs are required to fulfill the other needs which I have meant, uh, mentioned here. So now to cater to these challenges, actually technology came as a driver with its different capabilities and we saw a rapid growth in digital transformation. Can you move ahead of it? Yeah. And what we see, what, what we saw during that period is that there's a rise in number of ed tech uh, platforms, the rise in online groceries, food delivery, vegetable startups, rise in online medical consultation and ph uh, pharmacies. We also saw master growth of fintechs, which came up with different financial products and services. We also saw, saw coming up of online recruitment platforms, which enabled the recruiters to recruit a perfect con candidate for uh, different uh, positions. We also saw a rise in office collaboration tools, which enable and make the work from home very efficient. Now, all these things actually helped each one of us immensely. But what it failed to do is to include each one of us. And that has happened because the pace with which this digital transformation happened was much, much more than the accessibility adoption. And that led us to two different problems. If we see from business perspective, they saw rising number of lawsuits against them for accessibility violation. And if, you, if we see from 
uh, the user's perspective, we see a rising digital divide. Now, this finding of ours is substantiated further with the data that we can refer on the next slide. Yeah, so if you have a look at uh, the graph here, what we see is a consistent rise in ADA uh, lawsuits uh, from 2018 onwards. We also found in some of the recent reports that approximately around 10 cases per day were filed for violation under ADA. Another reason for these increase in lawsuits uh, is the rising awareness among the people about their legal rights to have an accessible web content. Now, so far we have seen why and how actually the accessibility violation related to lawsuits are increasing. Now it's time to have a look at some of the common issues which are actually coming in and creating these rise in lawsuits or making your websites and portal uh, inaccessible. The next slide again. Yeah. So if you can see here, uh, here we have actually picked up the most common uh, and frequent digital accessibility issue, which uh, generally encountered by, uh, by scanning any one of the web pages. Uh, if you can see that the, the most or the most common one is the poor color contrast, uh, which has around 80, which was actually found on 85% of the home pages of the website, which were included in this particular research, followed by missing alternate text, uh, empty links, missing form level, empty buttons, missing document languages. Now, all these are categorized as issue because they actually act as blocker to people who have some sort of disability or the other, and it deprives them to exercise their digital rights or to access the digital content. And because of this, they inherently violate some of the uh, some of the famous regulations uh, in different geographies like ADA in US, Ontario law for disabled, disabled people in Canada, then Disability Discrimination Act in Australia, then EN301549 in European Union. Now, how to overcome this? So if I have to talk about at a very higher level, we can overcome this by, by following the CAG standard, which are mainly based upon four core principles, which is perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Now, when you include these principles to your web products or digital products, you can make your products accessible. Now, these uh, four principles are further broken down into different success criteria. And if you include those success criteria in the development phase of uh, websites or the web products, you will able to uh, achieve an accessible product, uh, which will be free from any kind of accessibility issue. So till now we have seen legal risks as a major problem with accessibility violation, but do we get only one value if we adopt accessibility? The answer to it is no. There are multiple value adds, value proposition, which you will get when you will follow or embark on the path of uh, accessibility. I mean, next slide. So here on this uh, slide, if you see, I have categorized the value proposition in two sections. The first one is the business value, and the second one is the noble value. So starting with the business value first, uh, it actually helps you promote innovation inherently in your products. And how it does that, it actually helps you improve your uh, search engine optimization uh, for your particular product or website. Uh, it improves the user experience, uh, it reduces the bounce rate, and uh, it actually uh, attract more number of uh, people to your digital product or website if you're doing certain business. And in that way, it improves uh, the revenue and it will improve your business. Secondly, it also helps you improve your brand equity. It helps create positive PR, create more loyal customer, inclusive user experience and create a sense of respect for the brand and, and gradually actually 
when your customer will feel that you, you care for them, then definitely they become a brand ambassador for your, for your product inherently. And you will have more referrals to your product and in that way, your brand will increase, your business will in increase. Now, obviously, when you make your product more accessible, more number of people will join and able to consume your product, will able to uh, have services from you. And in that way, you will have more extended market reach. Now, as per some of the recent data, uh, there are around 1 billion people with some sort of disability. And they have around spending power of uh, uh, close to 6 trillion USD. So you can think of the kind of revenue that you could attract towards uh, your business if you make your website and web product more accessible. That takes us to the next business value, which is reducing legal risks, about which I have actually talked in detail earlier as well. Because when you will make your web products more accessible, you will reduce the legal risk, the legal complications, and also the heavy penalty, which you might have to uh, bear if you do not follow it. Now, with that coming to the noble values, definitely it promotes digital equality. It reduces the digital divide. It opens up new opportunities for people with disability. It, it opens up the opportunities like new jobs, uh, a uh, new uh, kind of education that they can directly get uh, over digital platform. Uh, they can also go ahead and start their own business if they have that kind of accessibility. And that reduces the, their dependency to have someone uh, to help them to operate those digital platform and they can directly interact with them. And with that, they get a good raise in their self-confidence. Now, from these value proposition, we got the understanding that accessibility values are beyond legal risk reduction. And organizations should uh, definitely look forward towards accessibility as a core practice in their product development. And that will help them reap the value of accessibility. Now with this, I will hand over to this presentation to Avin. He will continue this uh, discussion on the topic, which is sectors gaining traction in web accessibility. Avin, over to you. Super, thank you so much, uh, Uttam. Uh, I think this is really insightful and I'm sure um, now with what, whatever information you shared, that kind of helps everyone understand that um, implementing digital accessibility is definitely just not the legal aspect, but there are a lot of values beyond that. And it is obviously the right thing to do, right? Um, now, now, what I want to kind of quickly touch base upon is kind of uh, the sectors that I've been seeing that has been gaining traction in terms of implementing accessibility. And they've been showing certain amount of strong interest that you know they want to kind of implement accessibility because of various reasons that you obviously specified before. But uh, I think most importantly, because they feel that's the right thing to do, right? Um, so as part of the business development uh, lead, I have been looking at data and I've, I've understood that some of these industries, uh, typically, for example, the hospitality industry, um, the healthcare industry, the IT security industry, um, media entertainment, banking, and the government and public sector. So these industries have been showing kind of some notable uh, growth. Uh, in terms of how they have been implementing accessibility or how they want to intend to implement accessibility. Um, typically, you know, um, if I if I look at some of the examples from here where uh, typically the IT industry, right? So now most of the SaaS products um, that has been built or most of the platform that is being built, even to cater to all the uh, needs that you were highlighting in the previous slide, um, um, you know, it is enabled by IT and, and obviously the security of the ap IT applications are important. And we have seen a very, very strong trend of, um, you know, companies who want to ensure that their websites and mobile applications are accessible um, 
be it from the uh, you know education sector or be it from the you know online deliveries or be it at the um, um, you know banking level or or all of that right so all all that kind of is taken care of uh, in the IT security bit and even if I look at the trending growth of the media entertainment industry I think post pandemic it was more and more obvious that you know um, two two industries needed most of the attention one was obviously the hospitality industry which all <clears throat> and the other one uh, was the media entertainment along with that the healthcare right so um, now now these three industries have taken accessibility up fairly very seriously now right and and if you look at um the media entertainment industry the applications that that is very very popular now like for example netflix hotstar bunch of other ott apps um they they realize the importance of making things accessible and some of them are already some of them have started the journey some of them are in the midway and and some of them are starting so i think that's a that's a good trend that we see uh, in in growth as of now um even from the banking sector uh, i think what what we have been looking at as a trend is obviously the banking industry understood um that there was a lot of impact of um, digital growth right and 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 the moment they started implementing a lot of digital activity uh, or, or in their applications, um, they started making things accessible. And and it is a directly linked application for customers. So they felt that it's very very important to address those needs. Um, I have also seen a lot of traction come in from like uh, obviously the banking sector in the US and Canada, they were already implementing accessibility because of the, um, you know, strict guidelines. But what I've also seen now is um, industries, uh, or, or typically, sorry, the banking in Australia, New Zealand, um, even Middle East, um, and some of the banks in India, now they are actually taking up accessibility uh, seriously, and some of them have already started their journey uh, in some of the regions that I mentioned. Um, I've also seen this trend where, you know, um, a, a lot of government um, entities um, in regions like Australia, New Zealand, um, and um, even in Middle East, they are now talking more around accessibility and implementing accessibility for the public facing sites. Along with that, they are also looking at some of the internal sites as well. So there is a very, very clear indication that accessibility is starting to become mainstream and and uh, all these industries are taking this up uh, very very seriously and i think one more industry that i can definitely highlight which is catching up is um the um education industry as well right so so all all, all of these are kind of um uh, industries that i've highlighted i'm sure there are more industries that are catching up but that but these are some of them that i definitely felt are gaining traction um with this i also want to come to the point where we want to talk about what are the um, you know uh, new things that are coming up in terms of accessibility standards right so we we all now um, have been looking at WCAG 2.1 as a standard for quite some time. And then um, we have a new version which is proposed currently. Um, the, the new version is in the candidate recommendation phase, but that is the VCAG 2.2 uh, that is right now at the candidate recommendation stage. And um, this is uh, expected to uh, come in um, fairly soon, um, most likely early next year. Um, now, it, it also kind of, um, you know, brings in a set of few new success criteria that gets that would get added, uh, typically um, nine of them. Uh, as per the candidate recommendation version, which was published on 6th um, of September 2022. Um, and uh, with this WCAG 2.2, I think this should ideally be ready sometimes typically towards the end of the year or, you know, beginning of next year. Um, that's that's a predicted 
um, uh, timeline. Um, and then followed by that, I think the next new thing that, that should come up uh, right after that is the VCAG um, 3.0. Uh, which is kind of currently work in progress, but that's the next thing that's kind of expected to come in. Um, we also now need to understand that with all these WCAG guidelines coming out and how companies have been focusing on accessibility, uh, how has the market trend been, right? How has the market evolved? And, and some of the data that we looked up um, kind of indicates that there is a trajectory of growth in terms of the digital accessibility market. Um, the accessibility testing market, if we see starting 2019, which was around $448 million market, is projected to grow up to $606 million market by 2027. And um, you, you know the this accessibility testing market that, that we are talking about, I can see that growth in a way uh, over the last three years. I've seen that growth pattern follow. Um, so I think um, it is kind of heading in a, in a fairly strong growth stage. Uh, and, and it indicates a growth of around typically 4.1% CAGR if it grows at, at this predicted rate uh, until 2027. Um, we also kind of understand that North America and Europe um, has always come up as a kind of a dominating region for the accessibility testing market obviously because of the ADA law and the um, and the EN301549 and um, but but what we've also seen now as a trend is that the APAC market is also showcasing a strong growth um, and I think a couple of reasons behind that one is obviously the APAC market has been contributed to uh, has been contributing to a strong SaaS market growth and this SaaS market has been kind of uh, focusing in selling in the regions, uh, their products in the region of North America, Europe, um, and and few other countries, right? So the need of accessibility compliance obviously is very strong for those SaaS applications. And, and I think that's how the APAC market has been showing, uh, you know, strong growth. And I think we have very, very strong, notable customers in the APAC market who has been implementing accessibility, showcasing that trend. Um, we also expect, I think, Europe to um, you know, witness more and more considerable growth in the accessibility testing market. Um, we've been seeing um, you know, companies um, from France, we've been seeing companies from Germany, who has actually been uh, showcasing that they actually need uh, accessibility. And, and it's also indicative of the growth there. Um, and as I was talking about various government organizations across various countries uh, like Australia, New Zealand, Middle East, showcasing interest in accessibility. So I think over the next few years, we will definitely see a very, very strong growth in terms of the web accessibility market, um, testing market, and how things span across. So overall, if I, if I look at uh, all these information, I think um, we we have were able to build some kind of a predictability um, around how we feel digital accessibility adoption would have would be in 2023. So one indicative, which is the primary, which is the first one, is uh, kind of there is a like the accessibility growth started slow but it is now steady and it is growing. So I think the one of the important predictions that I think as we move into 2023 will be that the digital accessibility market would be growing steadily and inching more and more towards, um, you know, building more and more accessible products um, right from the development stage itself and, and not at the post production for organizations as priority. Um, the other indicative prediction is that as as uh, you know uh, Uttam showed in the slide that the lawsuits have been increasing year over year and um, typically you know there has been a 23% uh, day-to-day uh, -day growth in, in terms of the number of legal lawsuits. So with more and more stricter regulations coming across 
Um, obviously, the, there is a higher chance and predictability of lawsuits going up. Um, but again, uh, it is also important that you know uh, companies start focusing on implementing accessibility um, right now as a focus uh, at the right at the development stage with a shift left concept so that you know a lot of these can be avoided and i think that's that's an indicative where uh, with the strong um, market adoption and companies reaching out uh, for implementing accessibility on a day to day basis it definitely looks like companies are looking at more accessible solutions um, that can help them sustain this accessibility journey so i think in 2023 the goal for a lot of companies will be to kind of create uh, like either to start the accessibility journey uh, at if they are at certain stage and then to maintain that accessibility journey through their development process and then eventually build up a sustainable system to continue to that journey forward um yeah the the new normal obviously for the accessibility standard predictability predicted is the vacac 2.2 which should ideally be out sometimes next year um and uh, and then you know 3.0 should be a reality soon may not be next year but sometimes but that that's also some one predictable thing that that's going to happen uh, there is a lot of adoption to ai and machine learning uh, solutions where uh, there are automated uh, scans and fixes and with that i'm mostly referring to tools that can identify uh, the issues on pages and then at least provide the recommendation on how to fix it i'm not talking about you know the <clears throat> layover overlay solutions um, but rather it, it's kind of you know taking the automated results and fixing it um, in the code itself so that that you know you do the right thing and and just not rely on something which is very very temporary um having said that i think we at dq have also been investing heavily in in terms of ai and machine learning uh, and um, you know some of our tools like for example the axe dev tools free version that we have on our site which is our browser extension and eventually the uh, one of the axe dev tools pro which is a paid version for our tools you you will be able to see that we we have invested heavily on that in terms of machine learning and ai where you know it, it's mostly you, you know we can showcase the issues and uh, you get the recommendation on how to fix them so i'm sure a lot of other companies are doing that and i think that's one of the other predictability that is there um accessibility uh skills um, set to be in demand i think that's very very evident that with, if, with the market growing there needs to be more and more um, you know developers testers designers who have hands-on knowledge about accessibility right and um, that can be achieved more and more by either training um, learning and implementing accessibility on in their day-to-day -day work so um, obviously that's a skill that needs to be um, improved and um, learned uh, and, and you need to learn more and more um, and uh, keep up with the changing uh, guidelines and standards and all of that right so um, definitely that's another trend that where I think we see that a lot of companies are now focusing towards training their team members for every role that they do and how they can deliver accessibility solutions in their respective roles um, and uh, all of this is because I think there is a rise in the consumer awareness and expectation of, um, you know, procuring and using accessible products. And this um, rise in consumer expectation will continue because that's that's the right thing. And and you know, you being able to use accessible solution, um, that is the uh, you know most important thing that anyone would want to do. So these are some of the um you know predictability that um i i could figure out is something that should definitely happen in 2023 um so now that we've all realized that you know these are um this this is the predictability we have understood you know why digital accessibility is important we have understood the benefits of implementing all of this i think now what we need to understand is as an organization if we want to get into this journey towards accessibility you know um, how do we 
start and and where are we and how how can we take things forward right so um you know if you if you look at um this slide what we are talking about here is as an organization and as we have evaluated a lot of customers and seen their journey trends over these many years uh, or typically the last 23 years of dqs um starting of the business um we we realize that there are three segments primarily where customers are or organizations are uh, one is at the beginner stage the second is at the intermediate stage and the third is at the advanced stage of accessibility journey now when i talk about the beginner stage we are talking about organizations where they know um, that accessibility compliance is the need of the hour because of some of their customer requirement or their client requirement but um, they do not have uh, prior experience of implementing web accessibility or they do not have a team that uh, is in-house that can implement web accessibility as well right so um but but they they need to kind of get to that stage and and for that um the adoption strategy that they mostly opt for is kind of um outsourcing this requirement to a vendor and and trying to get an assessment report that can help them to understand the accessibility issues that are there on their application. And then they get certain kind of a uh, remediation help and a validation help as they fix those issues. And they also kind of um, want to kind of learn uh, a little bit in depth about accessibility. And, and they would prefer to use certain tools that can allow them to uh, quickly fix these issues uh, like for example the ax uh, dev tools free version um, is something that they normally can download and use um, and and kind of get to a quick fix and validation phases right the other aspect other level uh, that we have seen uh, for organizations is the intermediate level where you know organizations must have executed a couple of projects already for audit services um, and uh, and they have uh, the basic understanding of accessibility development uh, and QA practices. Um, they have um, hands-on experience on using some of the free tools um, that are out there, um, and and maybe possibly our Axe tool as well because uh, that's a very popular rule engine. And then um, you know uh, the team does perform time and again some random checks to track issues uh, of what they're building and how to fix them um, now for for those companies who are at the intermediate level um, what they normally prefer to do we have seen is kind of train their team on role-based accessibility trainings right like what should a designer do in terms of accessibility what should a developer do in terms of accessibility uh, what should a tester do in terms of accessibility the goal for them is they want to shift left right uh, they want to look at accessibility right at the design phase so they uh, we've seen these companies kind of showing more and more interest towards procuring um, training services and then eventually moving into tools so that they can enhance their productivity and uh, kind of give the right tools to the right set of people who can use these tools and deliver better productive accessible solutions quickly right so for them uh, for companies that are at the intermediate level maybe their journey does not start at the audit services level but rather it starts at the role based training level and then follows it up to the procurement of the tools um and then uh, companies that are at the advanced stage you know for those companies what we are looking at is they typically already have a well established um, you know, development and QA team and a designer team who knows about accessibility. They are kind of well trained, and they have started implementing accessibility uh, right from the design phase. So, so they want to ensure that whatever they ship out is accessible. So they've taken that up as a core mission, uh, and they are kind of inclined towards uh, shifting left completely, right? So, so that that's an organization that is at the advanced stage of accessibility. And for that, um, you know, what we uh, realized is there are a couple of things. One is they, they typically have a well-established uh, strategy within the organization that they want, that how and 
why and where they want to implement accessibility. And, and they might be looking at purely uh, products that can help them uh, shift left at every stage of development. So, um, but and and their goal is to become completely self-sustainable uh, and implement accessibility in an ideal way in their day-to-day -day operations. And and another goal I think for them is to have the enhanced productivity of every team member uh, in terms of accessibility fixes that they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So with all of this um, understanding of organizations being at you know different levels, um, what we at DQ, we have been doing is we have been uh, focused on providing a uh, 360 degree solution for all this requirement. And um, typically our focus has been like, you know, offering training services to uh, whoever needs the training, offering services to organizations who start at the intermediate level and helping them mature to the self-sustainability journey, uh, eventually with the use of training and our products. Um, and obviously, we have products for every stage of development, starting from uh, for design, we have a we have a product now, which is also in a beta stage, which is known as Axe for Designers, um, where, you know, the ideal goal is that designers should be able to use the tool and implement accessibility right at the design phase. We already have Axe Dev Tools and a various few versions within Axe Dev Tools to allow developers to implement accessibility right at the uh, development stage, for example, when they're writing the static code, um, our tool can tell them whether the code that they've written is accessible or not with the use of tools like Axlinter, uh, which is a packaged offering of Axe Dev tools. And then if you're looking at building a, you know, complete 100% um, um, you know, team of QA who can look at 100% um, accessibility compliance, um, during the testing phase, then Axe Auditor is the tool that we have built that can help organizations do that testing process both manually as well as automated and achieve 100% accessibility compliance. And finally, we also created a tool which is a post-production tool so that you can kind of um, keep a monitoring track. Like for example, if you have a large website and you want to ensure that you want to keep a track of whether any of the accessibility content is changing periodically over a quarter a month, and you get want to get a consistent report and see your growth trend in terms of whether you are delivering um, you know, better accessibility solutions in, in those sites or you're uh, missing certain aspects. So the score trend graph in the Axe Monitor tool can tell all of that to you. So ideally, if you if you want to shift left, um, DQ is um, uh, equipped to provide you with all the necessary tools and guidance so that you can do that actively. Um, so with this, I think um, I, I would like to open up the forum for any question and answers that you have. Um, yep. Yes, Abin. Uh, I guess we have a few questions on the Q&A and also on the chat. All right, let's go ahead with the mm -hmm. Q&A bit of questions. All right, so I think the first question we have is by Gabriel. Given that there is no minimum font size specified in VCAG guidelines and the fact that text can be sized up to 200%, what is the minimum font size for disclosures and disclaimers. Um, Jay, if you're around, can you take that question up? Yeah. So as you said, like uh, we don't have uh, uh, defined specific guidelines from the minimum font level uh, font size perspective. So it all depends upon uh, your brand. Uh, I mean, how you uh, your website's branding exists. So, uh, how your usability testing has been done with with respect to your uh, website branding so there is no fixed uh, uh, answer for this it all depends upon your individual uh, branding of the website so from vecac perspective we don't have any any uh, defined rule for a minimum font size cool um thank you jay um i think the other question is 
any use cases for the uh, warehousing industry. Um, I don't recall that right now, Mridula, but maybe you know I can uh, check and see what are the various use cases for a warehousing industry. Um, and maybe we can get back to you. Um, and we can even connect and discuss like if there is a specific, uh, you know, um, domain or company that we are talking about here, and we can discuss strategies around that. Um, all right. Uh, I think we have a question from Tricia. Right. Okay. So, um, hello from Indonesia. Do you have any insights on countries where accessibility regulations is absent? Uh, how would you trend? How would the trend differ from other countries where accessible regulation is in practice? Okay, yeah. So uh, I think there are a, there are a lot of countries which are still in the phase of developing accessibility guidelines and implementing that as a uh, you know uh, like core thing, right? But the important aspect to understand here is. Um, Typically, when companies are where, where the regulation is absent, let's say in those countries are developing certain softwares that they eventually want to sell in the US market or Europe market or whatever, right? So uh, where the accessibility laws are, I'm saying stringent, right? So in as, as you inch towards expanding your business in those regions, uh, I think that that's where you will face the challenge because then... Uh, you know, from the procurement standpoint and from the compliance standpoint, you don't meet those regulations and then it, it will make procurement difficult. So even though, you know, the accessibility law might not exist in, in that particular country, but if you want to expand your business further, then it's definitely uh, important that you implement accessibility so that you, you can sell your product and solutions to countries where the law, law mandates it. I hope I was able to answer that. All right. Um, so I think there was another question which says, um, suggest something for servicing accessibility in manufacturing and hardware domain. Uh, How is the proposed trend in this sector? What kind of support customer wants for installed product at their remote locations? Um, I I see this trend uh, coming up uh, fairly recently, where um, um, I, I've been looking at some companies where they definitely want uh, accessibility in terms of uh, the hardware domain, um, and and especially you know for their websites through which you order. Um, you know, the hardware products and uh, even in, in terms of manufacturing, you know, in case you are looking at, um, you know, giving an experience to your vendors uh, who are kind of coming and, and delivering the products to you. So I've seen that trend there. Uh, it's, it's fairly a little newer trend. Um, and um, Obviously, accessibility is the right thing to do, even for that domain. Because uh, if you if you look at the hardware domain um, and customers wanting to procure it, so not only the site from where they procure it needs to be accessible, but even after procuring hardware, you know the support uh, that you render, like for example, the chat support, email support, and all of that, those also needs to be provided in an accessible medium. So I think there are trends and, and maybe we can share more information on that um, in, in some of our upcoming webinars, which is more um, very, very industry specific. Right. Okay. Um, I have, I think there is any, um, another question from Paula, uh, Paula Siddle. At E2, we provide test prep for high stakes English test in this field, there are unique challenges to follow VCAG. For example, alt text for a photo in a describe photo task would give away the answer. Uh, VCAG notes that if the alt text would make a test item invalid, we can give general description instead, but this leaves it impossible for visually impaired learners to 
answer those questions. In short, we have found these situations where one could achieve VECA compliance, but not genuine accessibility. In addition, for low English level courses, it can be extremely challenging to provide any alt text that matches the English language ability of learners. If anyone has any insights, that would be great. Jay, do you want to take this up? I think it, it's more around alt text and what's the right, right way to do it. You might want to read that question one more time, Jay. Yes, I need to read it again. Yeah. So, uh, so it's asking about alt text for a photo in a described photo task. Okay. So, uh, as I can understand, like, uh, is like uh, the alt text is being provided by any uh, any automated tools or maybe any artificial intelligence tool in your web in on your uh, website or portal. Yeah, I, I, th I think we need to discuss this. Uh, I, I think the question is fairly, it's a, it's a great question. Um, Paula, what we can do is we can definitely set up a time and we can discuss on this exact requirement because I think it will need us to have a little bit of a back and forth conversation to understand, you know, uh, what we are talking about here and if we have all the right answers. Um, Mansa, I think you can reach out to Paula and we can set up some time and have that conversation around this particular question. Sure, sure, sure thing. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Abhin, I guess we have to take a few more questions from the chat. Okay, yeah, Let, let's go Anup ahead. Anup has a question. Would you be able to give a few cases from edu sector? Uh, does it require haptics implementation to establish accessibility there? Hmm. Um, Jay, do you have an example of educational sector that you have uh, been working on? Uh, mostly the uh, ed tech companies where uh, maybe uh, if I if I take the example of the learning management portals where we have a lot of uh, educational contents in the terms of, of video, audio and those kind of things. So all the concepts related to multimedia uh, accessibility applies there. Right, where we have uh, where you have videos and audios where we need to provide uh, proper captioning and transcript. So those kind of uh, uh, concept related to multimedia accessibility definitely applies there. Super. And uh, I think we had a webinar on multimedia a couple of months back. So maybe Mansa, you can share uh, the YouTube link for that. Yep, yep. Awesome. Uh, coming to the next question, Pete has a question. Are there still innovations into the physical human computer interfaces? Um, uh, can you come back to that question one more time? Are there still innovations into the physical human computer interfaces? Yeah, I, I think there is, right? Like uh, we, we, while we were uh, prep, prepping up for this webinar, we, we actually saw uh, a lot of things that are happening. Uh, I think um, if you remember, one of them was that, uh, yeah. you know, the, yeah, one of them was that, and that was related to the neural network. So uh, actually, there's a company, uh, uh, there's a company actually headed by Elon Musk, and they are coming with, uh, 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 they're coming with a concept called uh, brain computer interface and they are using the concept of uh, uh, the neural network to actually uh, uh, catch the signals which are coming from the nerve and they are using that particular signal on an interface and by that interface the person who are having some uh, mental challenges uh, say for example cere cerebral palsy or some other challenges so those people even can interact with a certain platform. So the work is really uh, going in this direction as well. Great. Uh, coming to the next question, Aben. Subaredi mm -hmm. is asking, can AI and ML help us achieve 100% accessibility? Yeah, beautiful question. I love this whenever this comes, right? Okay, so the answer is no, you cannot. Right, you you cannot achieve hundred percent right now um, with AI and ML. Um, 
even we at DQ with one of uh, our tools, which is Axe Dev Tools, um, and that toward the enterprise level tool, we we uh, and even the pro version of the tool, what we claim is we can achieve up to eighty four percent of accessibility issue coverage, um, and even that eighty four percent has two components. So one component is uh, we we use something called as Axe Core rule engine, which is the most popular rule engine um uh, used by you know for example google in their lighthouse product because we have a strategic partnership we it is used by microsoft and it is used by fairly a lot a lot of other companies because it's a free open source one that we have created um now that allows you to cover up to 57 percent of issue coverage and um that is the same core rule engine um with certain updates obviously we run it on, on our paid version, which uh, can also give you similar results, right? So it will give you 57% of pure play automation, um, where you should be able to see the issues, um, like scan the issues, and, and the tool will give you recommendations on how to fix it. But in addition to that, we have implemented something called as IGT, which is an intelligent guided testing format in the tool that can help you achieve that additional 27%. That we are talking about but beyond that beyond 84 percent um the remaining 16 percent still has to be manual testing um our tool does show you what are the things that you have to still do as manual testing but that's how it is so typically you know the maximum possibility with pure play automation 57 percent as of now with igt capabilities up to 84 um, but uh, yeah, work is in progress to see if we can achieve more, but that's how it is, right? And and I'm not talking about anything about an overlay solution or anything, which one we don't have, and and I don't think so that's, uh, that's something where everyone says that's not the right way of implementing accessibility because some overlay solutions do claim that it can take care of everything, but it really doesn't work. Thank you, Aben. Uh, we have Ricky and he's asking, do you think the market for self-directed digital accessibility training will increase or is the need for ILT trending stronger? Oh, yeah, that, that's also a lovely question. I think, yeah, there are two aspects to it. Um, so as you said, the self-directed um, digital accessibility training. Now, what I feel is a uh, self-directed digital accessibility training can work, provided it's it's more like a video, audio interactive course um, where you know it it is like an instructor but digitally training, right? That that works. But if you just want someone to understand only theoretical, you know, documentation, it's a little difficult because being the topic uh, a bit new and and people are still learning about it so just theoretical knowledge is a little difficult um, and obviously instructor-led training has a much stronger impact because the moment you do an instructor-led training like for example the way we do it at DQ we obviously cover the concepts but the most important thing that we do is we take care of the hands-on exercises so we make people do what we explain as a concept during the session itself, which gives them a much better understanding of how to do it in their day-to-day -day life. So both have their um, you know, own benefits, but um, if, if you have to say um, you know, which one is better, um, again, it completely depends on the organizational requirement and how they want to take it. So if you want to take accessibility as a journey slowly, you want to learn first and then you know, get Im uh, and want to immerse into a ILT, you can do that. And if you want to know, I, I want to build the knowledge and hands on right away, then ILT is the best solution. Great. Uh, thank you, Aben. I guess we'll take one or two questions because we're over time by two minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Batsi is asking for the alternative text questions. I think accessibility goes beyond all text and tech implementations. It might require you to design questions suitable for people of determination. As you've seen, they can't be given the same uh, questions as everyone else. Think of it as 
equitable design to make your platforms equitable it requires you to tweak the platforms and it can it's content from for a different users uh i guess it's not a question so but see yep you're absolutely right for that yep yep uh, any more questions okay i think there was a few quickly i can uh, we can finish i think one is uh, how about the accessibility scope in network and telecommunication industry? Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I think there is scope. Um, I, I've seen companies uh, like some of the telecom companies from Australia uh, reaching out to us and talking about uh, accessibility. And, and we've also seen a few telecom companies uh, from the US as well doing that. So uh, I definitely see there is a scope. And um, um, yeah, accessibility is important in, in that market as well, right? Because now we are now now telecom is um, just not only, you know, about um, just the voice communication uh, at some point of time, but it's, it's now much, much more. Um, so it has a lot to offer, uh, especially, you know, applications that they have built, which has, you know, various segments of OTT offerings and various things. So I definitely feel that's another market that's definitely transitioning well. Um, is there any word limit to define alt text for informative image? Um, um, I think uh, Jay can take that. Jay, is there any word limit for alt text in informative image? Mm, uh, I believe it, will, it is 256. Okay. Um, yeah, 256 is what Jay believes, but I think we can oh, I need to check on that. But yeah, so usually we are uh, as a guidance, we say that uh, let's any alt text or any uh, or a yeah, level for any uh, any component, let's make sure that it's not too long because uh, ultimately it gets read by your screen reader. And if the text is too long, then uh, definitely it will be an annoying experience to the end user. So but, we should uh, alt text should be short, and if you have uh, more informations to be followed for that particular image, you can always have a um, uh, a better way of describing it. Okay, so the alt text can be short, and then additional information you can describe it with different ways. Super. Thank you, Jay. So thank you so much, everyone. I think we are a little over time, and. Uh, um, <clears throat> thank you for all of your attendance. Here is a quick um, a slide which talks about where you can connect with us. So if you want to reach our team, you can always email us at marketing-india at dq.com. We also have a DQ systems-apac LinkedIn page where you can also connect with us. Apart from that, we obviously have our Twitter handle and YouTube channel, which you can go through along with the GitHub. Um, also, um, just one one other quick thing is we are kind of um, doing the AxCon event, um, which is uh, you know one of the largest digital accessibility conference organized by DQ. Uh, that is scheduled to happen on March 16th, 15th, and 16th, uh, 2023. Uh, you can definitely visit our LinkedIn page to register. And, um, you know, my team, Mansa and team can actually give you more information on that. Thank you so much, Avin and Uttam, uh, for a great insights and also to the amazing audience we had. Uh, we are sharing a summarized PDF link uh, in the chat description. So feel free to download and share it with your fellow members as well. Super. Great. So thank you so much, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you soon in our next set of webinars. Um, thank you for uh, everyone who could make it. And thanks for, um, you know, going a little over time. And it was a really, really insightful session. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.